Okay, um, hello everyone. So the, the person who was uh, uh, in charge of um, presenting our speaker today is not uh, connected yet, so I'm going to do it. Sorry if I'm not um, as good as uh, <laughs> it would have been. Uh, so for a start, our two students are going to present the work of uh, the other. Um, so Malta, Montserrat, Rondrel, excuse me, Sosa. for <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> presentation, I'm really sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> he's, got, um, he's a student, he's a um, PhD student at uh, IBDM and uh, ha had a chat with uh, Hannah Im, who is a um, PhD student at INT. And... Um, She's going to present Anna's uh, work. Then Anna, you, um, it will be your turn. And afterwards, um, everybody will ask you a question uh, before um, Emmanuel's talk later. So Marta, that's your turn. Okay. So you are seeing my screen already? Mm -hmm. okay. yes, perfect. We will just, just try to use the pointer. Okay, perfect. So today we'll present uh, Hannah's work. She works as the team CANOP at the Latimon, and it's a team that study neurodevelopment in psychiatric cohorts. So this is one of the first work that Hannah has done as part of her PhD, and it's entitled Childhood Trauma, Attachment Wounds, and Suicidal Behavior. So to start uh, the suicide, uh, it's really common in our society, and it's the 17th leading cause of death worldwide. We need to understand the concept that it's suicidal behavior that englobes idea, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and completed suicide. The suicide risk is especially high in the people with the mood disorders. For example, one third of the patients uh, with major depression have attempted to commit suicide once in their life, and this increase up to two thirds in patients with bipolar depression. Therefore, the study of risk factors and different markers that leads to this suicidal behavior is necessary for its prevention. And so there are different models or ways to try to understand these risk factors, but Hannah works in one model that have like three different components in the time. We can have some risk distal factors that are early lifetime experiences, such as childhood trauma. We can have then developmental risk factors that are related, for example, with our attachment systems. And then we can have a proximal factors that are events that the person is experienced, like in the present moment of the suicidal ideation. So what Hannah wants to do or did is that she was um, searching on what are the different risk factors that people that pass from the idea to the suicide, to the act of the suicide, share. If, for example, there are some type of um, patterns or phenotypes that could prompt these people to pass more easily from the idea to the act. So I will go a bit deep in each one of these risk factors. So I will start with the distal factor that is the childhood trauma, for example which is um, defined as all types of abuse and neglect occurring before the age of 18. We have five different types of subtypes of childhood trauma, sexual, physical, emotional abuse, and emotional or physical neglect. The experience of a childhood trauma is related with mental disorders and higher symptoms, like higher severity on the symptoms in these disorders and lower response to treatment. And the childhood trauma is related as well with adult suicidal behavior. As survivors of this uh, childhood trauma show two to five times higher risk to attempt suicide in the adulthood. 
And uh, the experience of this childhood trauma is really closely linked to the development of our attachment bounds. So the attachment theory says that the children will develop a sense of self and inner security through the relationship with their primary caregivers, uh, usually one or both parents. So since this age, we develop working models that would like to set mental and affective representations, and we will set how we experience others and how we experience ourselves. The thing is that people with childhood trauma have a, let's say, a different working models because these uh, people are marked by low self-esteem and hopelessness. And these uh, people that has experienced childhood trauma as well have uh, like an attachment system that it's a bit extreme, let's say, because they could have attachment anxiety, meaning that when these people is under stress, they will seek a lot for people like seeking for help. Or we can have like the other extreme that will be the attachment avoidance. That means that when you are under stress, instead of going and seek for the people, you avoid the people. And so these two attachment anxiety or attachment avoidance by themselves are related with adult suicidal behaviors. So what Hannah did is to try to put all this model with the different components and see if this uh, we could um, apply it to a real population. So she analyzed the data of 96 patients diagnosed with mood disorders and she did some mediating analysis to see if the experience of a childhood trauma will lead a prom, uh, to a person to attempt suicide, and if this could be mediated by either an attachment avoidance or attachment anxiety. And so in that she found that yes, this effect was mediated by attachment avoidance, meaning that the people that experience childhood trauma that have an attachment avoidance system will uh, commit or will have a higher risk to attempt suicide. So this was very interesting for her because this could mean that there is a neurodevelopmental subtype of people that present this higher risk to attempt suicide and that this could be defined or we can have risk factors in this um, childhood trauma and this attachment avoidance behaviors. So she did the same type of analysis but to try to understand um, or to try to predict, let's say, suicidal ideation, not suicidal attempt as before. And so, but in this part, she couldn't find a still like a significant um, result, except that it was a bit related with emotional abuse. So uh, this means that the suicidal ideation is a bit uh, more complex and underlies probably many different other factors that Hannah has different ideas of this and that she's willing to discuss with you. And so finally, uh, Hannah thanks all her contributors. Thank you. And um, thank you. <laughs> I hope I didn't disappoint you. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I will say the, the opposite thing. Perfectly explained. Thank you very much. <laughs> so let's see how I do with your subject <laughs> because it's completely based on a completely different field of neuroscience. Yes, you'll see that they're completely different. Yeah, but that's uh, the point of the, of the thing. So I can share my screen. And um, so can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. So now we're going into a completely different field. I have the pleasure to um, present the work of Monza, who just talked um, about my, my subject. Um, and we're going far away from psychology and back to biology. <laughs> Um, Mansa is working on uh, just uh, some time. So Mansa is working on pancreatic cancer and the interplay of neurons and glial cells. So you might know or you might not know, as me, for example, <laughs> that tumors um, consist of different cell types. So next to tumor cells, we also have fibroblast and immune cells, and each of these cell types contribute differently to the progression or the awareness of the tumor. 
Um, but interestingly, and that is what is interesting to Monsa, um, there are infertility neurons that also seem to communicate with the, um, with the tumor environment. And that also takes some role in the disease progression. And that has been a question that was also interesting to the team of um, Monsa. And what they, and this is also what we will focus on in this talk. So what happens with the sympathetic nervous system during tumor progression? And what the team of Monsa observed in previous work is uh, they looked at precancerous pre -cancerous lesions, <laughs> and they already saw that the synthetic system remodels and hyper innovates these lesions with the axons. So they wanted to know what, what kind of role are these axons playing. Uh, let me just uh, activate the laser pointer. And uh, so in the first step, they depleted the axons, so they cut the axons. And they saw that actually the tumor grew bigger, it had more metastasis, and the median survival of the mouse decreased. So they took the conclusion that probably the system had a protective effect and would normally try to stop the tumor progression. The next question is how? <laughs> so um, how does this mechanism work? And one hypothesis is that some cells are releasing signals for axonal growth during the pathology. And that this means that the cells would respond to some changes in the microenvironment of the tumor. And then the next step was um, probably these are cells that are in proximity to the nerves. And one candidate are Schwann cells. And Monza is focusing on Schwann cells in, in her work. And her hypothesis was that Schwann cells contribute to the remodeling of the synthetic fibers during tumor development. And in the first step, she compared healthy tissue to, um, to a genetic model of precancerous lesions. And she looked at the amount of Schwann cells and synthetic fibers. And as you can already see here, she found more Schwann cells and more synthetic fibers in the precancerous lesions. Here she did another, um, she, she depicted it differently. And interestingly, she finds the highest amount of Schwann cells during the precancerous stages not during the cancer stage. So that led her to the idea that an actual trigger of this activation of swan cells could be inflammation. But of course, she also needed to test this. So her second question was, could inflammation induce exonal remodeling and possible swan cell activation? So she induced another model um, of chronic inflammation, chronic pancreatitis, and looked again at the amount of swan cells and synthetic fibers. And uh, it must also be said that precancerous lesions and her model of chronic inflammation had the same um, amount of lesions or was comparable um, regarding the lesions. And again, um, she found heightened amount of Schwann cells and heightened amounts of synthetic fibers, which was exciting because that could mean that indeed inflammation is triggering this process. Next step is how do Schwann cells and axons communicate? So um, in order to communicate, they have to express proteins or um, factors. Um, and the usual way to find out which factor um, is interesting would be single cell sequencing. Unfortunately, that didn't work. So once it turned to literature and um, found a protein called GDNF that is expressed by swan cells um, when there's nerve uh, damage and in order to regrow um, neurons. So it could be interesting. And in the first step, she looked at her chronic pancreatitis model and looked if she would find this protein. And as we can see, here is the cell. And at the same um, place, we also find the protein. So that means um, this is expressed by these cells. The second step is, is there also the corresponding receptor in the neurons, in the synthetic fibers? And as we, so she looked at this and she applied markers and she could see it in the healthy tissue, in the precancerous model, and also in the chronic inflammation model. So here's the neuron and here's the receptors. So far, so good. <laughs> the next step, the third step was she, she cell cultured synthetic neurons that innervate the pancreas, did this in healthy, uh, healthy mice and in chronic pancreatitis mice. And then she added um, the growth factor, GDNF, um, and actually measured the axons or the proliferation of the neurons. And what she could see is that in the presence of the GDNF, the axons grew longer. That 
was exactly uh, the hypothesis she had. So she was, uh, was the first confusion. Pancreatic Schwann cells proliferate during pancreatic cancer progression. And this reflects their possible activation and contribution as source of neurotrophic signals to induce the axonal growth. And um, now she already has ideas for her next experiments. <laughs> Um, wants to decrease GDNF and probably also wants to discuss this with you. Okay. And uh, thank you for her collaborators. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciated your um, presentation. Uh, really interesting and uh, really clear. Uh, so maybe now we can um, have some questions. Um, I don't know if uh, someone wants to start. Orion, can you see if there is a question? No, I don't see one. You've been too clear, girls. <laughs> or too clear or too unclear. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you've got a question for the other. Marta, uh, so, you... Hannah, uh, you can tell us whether your other ideas seem the, like for the suicidal ideation. Yeah. So, um, so the, the question is actually is uh, there a difference between chronic suicide risk and uh, maybe um, the, the acute risk and suicide ideation is probably the acute risk. And one thing that I asked myself is because uh, there's a lot of literature right now about emotional abuse and about emotional pain. And I asked myself right now is maybe this direct effect that we found on suicide ideation linked to the sensation of emotional pain and that is quite interesting because we also um, find a lot of interest in literature on alternative pain perception for example in survivors of childhood trauma as well as in suicide attempters so i will definitely go and try to find some answers in this in in the future <laughs> yeah because this acute risk will be like uh, more like the proximal factors, like um, experiences that we are having, like closer to the present moment, exactly. not uh, through all our life. That is exactly true. But the question is also maybe through the experience of childhood trauma, we have a different perception of pain, and what we what they sometimes and then the question is how long does pain last? So. How long does physical pain last? So, for example, um, there's also a difference in the childhood trauma. For example, neglect is more bound to uh, to different pain, um, and uh, abuse again to a different pain, and also to numbing responses. And that would be probably an interesting topic to explore. But yeah. Anna, you've got um, two questions. Uh, yeah. The first one from Florian Vernet, who can yeah. speak. Um, Anna's topic is really at the interface between neuroscience and psychology. Yeah. How does a research team collaborate with these two fields, which involves a really different perspective on the studied stu oh sorry studied studied population and experimental protocols yeah so what we try to do we work on psychiatric cohorts so we have the framework of psychology and what we then try to do is we apply um, neuroscientific methods so what we're looking at um, what I try to look at in my thesis so this was the first work but um, furthermore I want to investigate First of all, how do they perceive pain? And second of all, how do they perceive social support? And I will measure heart rate variability, for example. And there we enter neuroscience. Um, and we also, in our team, we also work with um, genetic models. So we calculate statistical models in order to combine genetic 
components with um, psychological symptoms. Thank you. Does that respond to the question? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, maybe Flo, yes, thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, Jihan asked, uh, what is your next step to investigate the hypothesis we're yeah. talking with uh, Martha? Yeah, so the next step would see um, how childhood trauma um, is linked to the perception of psychological pain. So taking it stepwise, um, or also how childhood trauma is linked to the perception of social uh, support and how this is linked to body signals, to, uh, to responses, physiological responses. Okay, uh, there is another question for you, Hannah. Uh, sorry, Martha. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have time to discuss it. Uh, <laughs> no, from, okay. uh, from Florence Molinari. Uh, so thank you. A question for Hannah. Was there a particular trigger before people commit or try to commit suicide? And did they receive uh, psychological help before? Yeah. So in the study, what they did is um, they measured if um, they measured um, recent life events, but I didn't account for that. But of course, um, that is quite known from the literature that in in the um, that suicide attempts are very often triggered by, for example, interpersonal problems, and that, for example, um, uh, separation from a loved one can be quite triggering point um, can be a triggering event for suicide attempt. But um, to be said we didn't, or I didn't take it into account um, when I calculated the models. And this is exactly um, why probably we, we did not find an effect for suicidal ideation, or this is one of my hypotheses, because suicidal ideation can be triggered by so many things. And especially um, when, we, when we imagine it as, a, as influence of variance, and we imagine that a lot of this has influence, and childhood trauma might have only had a small influence compared to recent life events like a separation or um, losing the job or some, some other event that triggers hopelessness. Or hopelessness itself. Yeah. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, of course, if you have a question. Uh, we have one more, Gabrielle, I think, in the chat. In the chat? Oh, yeah. One for Martha, oh, yes. I think. Uh, for uh, Martha, okay. We talk both of you, and uh, that's from Pedro, who was talking uh, last month. <laughs> Monse, I don't know if you exposed expose it because I lost a couple of minutes of presentation, but are you planning to identify factors that include axonal recruitment growth? And do you think this could be used to test for axonal repair reconnection after injury? Yes, so that's uh, like the second big part of the project that we wanted to do. So to do that, and to try to understand this communication between the Schwann cells and the axons. Uh, so the idea was to do this single cell sequencing to characterize the Schwann cells and have an idea of how this communication was happening, how the Schwann cells were going uh, or were um, inducing possibly this remodeling of the axons. Since it's not working for the moment, still trying. So what I did was this big literature review. So Hannah today focused just on one of the molecules I saw, GDNF, that has a nice results. But I have a several other candidates about these possible molecules that are being released by the Schwann cells. Uh, and that could be, yes, indeed, um, contributing to this remodeling. I don't know if it answered your question. Yes, Thank we you. did. <laughs> and there's uh, another one just uh, before this one of uh, from Marta too. From Marta, uh, from Maria Cavacalli, yeah. Cavalli. Uh, Manse, do you know if Schwann cells are normal or tumor uh, secreted uh, stuff? 
Somebody could change uh, their fate. I don't know if I read, uh, read properly. Yes, so uh, mm, the assurances, yes, are known to secrete a lot of molecules like in pathologies that contributes or can uh, induce this axonal growth or remodeling. It's really well documented after nerve injury. It's a bit new in this cancer field, but yes, this is the idea. And if they can change their fate, so as well, like in another model, since they have a lot of plasticity, yes, they could uh, be changing their fate to another type of cells and be indeed contributing to the different uh, cell types that we can find in the tumor. Uh, for the moment, this was one of the another questions that we wanted to answer. So. For the moment, no, I haven't seen that the strand cells change their fate during tumor progression, but uh, I am still working on it. Thank you. Okay, um, so um, it's time for our next uh, speaker, Emmanuel Nivet, uh, who is a researcher and principal investigator at uh, the INP um, is team leader of the stem cell disease uh, modeling and neurogeneration since uh, two, 2018. And he's um, going to talk about um, human and cute pluripotent stem cells to study the role of astrocytes in Al Alzheimer's. So, um, Emmanuel, if you're ready, I'm going to stop my uh, screen and you can start when you want. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect then. Okay, first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present our latest results to the Marseille neuroscience community. And uh, during the next uh, 20 minutes, uh, I will try to convince you that human-induced prepotent stem cell-based model are of prime interest when we want to gain new knowledge on the role of glial cells in Alzheimer's disease. So to start, uh, just a few facts and figures regarding Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, let me try to see if I can get the pointer. Nope. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Uh, the prevalence of the disease uh, reaches a peak of nearly 15% around the age of 80. In France, around 1 million people, 1 million patients have been diagnosed for Alzheimer's disease. And today there is no cure and only few treatments for symptoms that are available. Obviously, Alzheimer's disease is well known for a memory loss and a, a strong cognitive decline in the patient, on those patients that are affected by the disease. And according to the World Health Organization, by 2050, we should reach around 152 million people that will be diagnosed for Alzheimer's disease, which make it very critical for the, for the future. So, we present Alzheimer's disease as a neurodegenerative disease characterized by cerebral atrophy, which is the consequence of a cascade of neuropathological events. According to the most classical view of the disease, the disease would result from the accumulation of APP neurotoxic byproducts. And the disease is also characterized by microtubule disorganization as a consequence of hyperphosphorylation of the tau protein in neurons. Ultimately, this sequence of events induce neuronal death and then leads to cognitive declines. So for a while, the vision, uh, this vision has made the, the neuron as the main and the only one cell target to understand the disease from a cellular and the molecular standpoint, but also to develop therapeutic strategies. 
However, as you all know, the brain cannot be resumed as a black box full of neurons, as it also contains billions of non-neuronal cells and especially glial cells. And amongst the glial cells, microglial cells and astrocytes are gaining lots of traction in the Alzheimer fields lately. And these two cell types play critical immune functions in the brain. And this is of importance because neuroinflammation is also one of the main features of Alzheimer's disease. So long seen as a simple consequence of the neuronal pathology, one emerging view is that inflammation could have more than a secondary role in the Alzheimer disease. And inflammation perhaps could have some important role early on in the disease. And this has been supported by several experimental and clinical observations. So the astrocyte is a highly critical brain cell type, sorry, is a highly critical brain cell type, which is involved in plethora of functions in the brain, including synaptic transmission, maintaining the blood brain barrier integ integrity, or also involved in the clearance and degradation of neurotoxic products. And obviously, like I already told you, this cell type is also critical for its role in the neuroinflammation uh, response. And this constellation of function places the astrocyte as a cell type of prime interest in Alzheimer disease pathogenesis. So the astrocyte is a cell type that becomes reactive upon injury or during brain disease. So on the one hand, this reactive state may have a beneficial role on the neuron and playing a protective role whilst maintaining homeostatic functions to support the neuronal functioning. But on the other hand, this reactive state could also play toxic, toxic function for the neurons. And this demonstrates the importance of controlling and maintaining a well-balanced inflammation in astrocytes. One important point that reinforces the existence of a link between the astrocytes and the disease, Alzheimer's disease, is that astrocytes are the main producers of brain apolipoprotein E, which is a transporter of lipids in the brain. And this is of importance. If we consider that APOE, if we consider that APOE is encoded by a polymorphic gene for which it has been identified three main isoforms in the human population, the APOE2, the APOE3, and the APOE4 isoforms. And the APOE4 isoform, which results from a SNP that changes the conformational structure of the protein, is the main genetic risk factor in Alzheimer disease. Not only the risk to develop Alzheimer disease is increased by APOE4 carriers, but also the age at onset is strongly reduced. And this places the study of APOE4 as a main entry point to try elucidating the mechanisms that could confer a high predisposition to develop the disease. So, so far, most studies have focused on the impact of astrocytic APOE4 through its action on the neuron. And it has been shown, for example, that APOE4 participate to the pathology through different mechanisms, including an increased production of toxic A beta by the neurons, and but also by promoting tau mediated neurodegeneration, also by reducing synaptogenesis. And moreover, the cell autonomous effects of APOE4 on the astrocytes have been demonstrated through a diminution of the capacity of degradation of clearance of the A beta. However, regarding the role of APOE4 on the inflammatory responses of astrocytes, remain quite contradictory, uh, even though most evidence pointed towards a pro-inflammatory role of APOE4 on astrocytes. Not to mention that the study of the APP metabolisms and tau-related mechan mechanisms have been poorly studied in the astrocyte itself. Therefore, one of the main objectives of my laboratory is to clarify the role of APOE4 in the astrocytes. And for the sake of today's presentation, I will only focus today on our results on inflammation. 
So to study human astrocytes in my team, we are using the IPSC technology for induced pluripotent stem cells. So in short, this technique allows for the reprogramming of somatic cells of a given patient into a pluripotent stem cell that share the same features as embryonic stem cells. And to illustrate the potential of human iPSCs, I like usually to say that iPSCs are like a smartphone in which we have plenty of apps. And those apps allow us to generate human cell type a la carte if we select, if we select a good, the good application, which will be a protocol of differentiation. So this is of special importance in the neuroscience field because now, thanks to this tool, we have the possibility to have access to an unlimited material of human brain cell type, such as astrocytes, neurons, also microglial cells. And in my lab, we have implemented a humanized in vitro model, allowing us to study human astrocytes and the role of the APOE genotype in their neuroinflammatory function. So to that end, we use the human iPSC2 technology to generate human astrocyte cultures. Human iPSCs are first differentiated into neural progenitors and thereafter into astrocytes. So the characterization of the generated culture showed that iPSC derived astrocytes do express the classical astrocytic markers such as glass, as you can see here on this immunostaining, or ALDH1 L1, again vimantin. And this has been characterized at both the genic, here demonstrated by some qPCR, but also at the proteic levels. So thanks to this robust protocol that we have developed and optimized, we have now generated astrocytes from different human IPSC, IPSC lines that were representative of different APOE genotype, and especially APOE3 homozygous line, APOE3-4 heterozygous line, and also APOE4 homozygous lines. And as you can see on this Western blot here, those astrocytes, which was, which was really important for us, do express the APOE protein. Using this strategy, we have been able to evaluate the impact of the APOE genotype on the inflammatory response of astrocytes that were stimulated for 24 hours with a cocktail of pro-inflammatory molecules. So we have performed a genetic profiling of nearly 80 genes, pro and anti-inflammatory genes. And we found that nearly 50% 50 50 of all pro-inflammatory genes that we analyzed were significantly increased in astrocytes that carry at least one copy of the APOE4 allele. This is what you can see here with four different genes, IL-6, IL-8, IL-1 beta, and CCL2, for example, in where you can see an increased response to inflammation in those astrocytes that are derived, that, that, that contain at least one uh, copy of the APOE4 allele. And this has been validated at the protein level by using ELISA, and you can see here by measuring the quantity of IL-6, interleukin-6, and interleukin-8 in the sculpture supernatant, we can see a much greater inflammatory response in those astrocytes that carry at least one copy of the APOE4 allele or two copies as compared to those that don't carry any APOE4 copies. So moving on, moving on uh, to this experiment and to test the specificity of this phenotype related to the APOE4 genotype, we then decided to generate isogenic control IPS IPSC lines using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So in short, what does it mean? It means that starting from IPSCs that are specific of a, of a given uh, donor that have an APOE3 homozygous genotype, we have modified specifically the genome of these cells to substitute one single nucleotide in order to convert those cells into an APOE4 homozygous genotype. So we generated several knock-in lines, isogenic control lines, that have been successfully validated using Sanger sequencing, but also demonstrated by the identification of the APOE4 protein only in those lines that have been converted from the APOE3-3 donor line. And in parallel, we have also generated some additional control lines, which were APOE knockout lines, 
for which we have deleted part of the APOE genes. And this has been validated again at the sequencing level, but also at the protein level with the loss of the APOE protein in those control lines. So then we decided to reproduce the exact same paradigm that uh, we did before by stimulating astrocyte with a pro-inflammatory cocktail. And what we observe, it's exactly the same um, result as what we observe in patient-specific lines. So basically, using APOE4 knock-in lines, we observe that the response to a pro-inflammatory cocktail, such as here with the IL-6 level and the IL-8 level, what was much, much greater in those astrocytes that carry the two copies of the APOE4 allele. And another very interesting observation, actually, was that when we did the same experiment in the APOE knockout astrocyte, we also observed this pro-inflammatory phenotype in APOE knockout astrocytes. So this demonstrated, basically, that APOE was very important for the inflammatory response from astrocytes. And another very interesting uh, observation was that if you look at these uh, red boxes, we observe that even in the absence of stimulation in those astrocytes, either APOE4 astrocyte or APOE knockout astrocyte, these cells were expressing a basal level of chronic inflammation, which was not the case in APOE33 uh, homozygous astrocytes. So based uh, on this uh, observation, we next wonder whether the disease phenotype we observed in APOE4 astrocytes could be rescued by the exogenous supplementation of APOE3 as a recombinant protein. And as a matter of fact, this is exactly what we observed in a dose-dependent manner, as shown here by the significant reduction of IL-6 and IL-8 production. You have the quantification here of this Western blot. Um, that were treated with the highest dose of APOE3. So by adding APOE3 in APOE4 astrocyte, we could rescue the pro-inflammatory phenotype of this astrocyte. And in a reverse experiment, we also found that the application of APOE4 recombinant protein in APOE3 astrocyte culture was sufficient to exacerbate the inflammatory response from those APOE3 astrocytes. And this was demonstrated by a significant increase of the interleukin level, such as here again, IL-6 and IL-8. And you have here the statistical differences uh, for those two uh, interleukins. And it was also very interesting to note that contrary to the, risk, to the rescue experiment with the APOE3, we observed that the low dose of APOE4 was necessary and sufficient to induce a pro-inflammatory phenotype in human astrocytes. So this suggested that APOE4 could compete with APOE3 to have its pro-inflammatory action. So in the next series of experiments, we confirm this hypothesis by performing a competitive experiment between APOE3 and APOE4. So basically what we have done is that starting from an APOE knockout astrocyte line, we first identified the dose of APOE3 at which we could recover the physiological response, inflammatory response from astrocyte, which was more or less 400 microgram per milliliter. And next, we apply different ratio of APOE3 and APOE4, and we identified that cells started to exacerbate their inflammatory response when the concentration of APOE4 was 40 times lower than the one of APOE3 in the cells which was even, even more true and significant at a one to four ratio. So this set of data for us was the ultimate demonstration that APOE4 exerts its pro-inflammatory action in astrocytes through a dominant negative effect. So then we used a molecule that can correct the conformational, conformational structure of APOE4 and generate an APOE3-like structure. And as shown here, we found that exogenous application of this PH002 molecule actually can significantly diminish the inflammatory response from APOE4 for astrocytes, demonstrating the, the, the high importance of the conformational structure of APOE4 
in the disease phenotype that we observed in astrocytes. And to investigate deeper the molecular mechanisms by which APOE4 could alter the control of inflammation in astrocytes, we next decided to perform DNA microarray experiments to compare the transcriptome of APOE3 astrocytes and their APOE4 knocking counterparts. And as expected, the analysis of differentially regulated genes revealed a strong dysregulation in numerous genes that are involved in inflammatory pathway. And more specifically, we observed that almost all the members of this NF-kappa-B signaling pathway, which is very important for inflammation, those members were dysregulated in APOE4 astrocytes. So this led us to validate that the pro-inflammatory pro phenotype observed under the APOE4 genotype could result from NF-kappa-B dysregulation. So this has been confirmed at least at the, at the um, transcriptional level by analyzing by qPCR different members of the NF-kappa-B pathway. And we observed that in APOE4 astrocyte, as well as in APOE knockout astrocyte, most of these members were strongly, uh, strongly upregulated in those uh, cells. Moreover, we observed a greater translocation of the P P65 subunit, uh, tr nuclear translocation of the P65 subunit in APOE4 astrocytes. And this confirmed a greater functional activation of the NF-kappa-B signaling under this APOE4 genotype. But obviously, we next wondered how APOE could regulate NF-kappa-B activity in human astrocytes. So to make a very long story short, thanks to our DNA microarray analysis, combined with some data mining, we have been able to identify a protein of interest namely transgenin 3, TAGLN3 here, that was strongly downregulated in APOE4 astrocyte as well as in APOE knockout astrocyte. And this has been confirmed, as you can see here, at the protein level, but also at the genic level. Interestingly, this was the case in both APOE4 and APOE knockout astrocytes. Establishing thus a functional link between the downregulation of transgenin 3 and the APOE4 genotype, we next demonstrated that the exogenous application of APOE3 on APOE4 astrocytes could recover the level of transgenin 3 expression in APOE3 in APOE4 astrocytes. And this demonstrates the existence of a novel APOE transgenin 3 axis that is involved in the regulation of inflammation in astrocytes. So then the critical role of transgenin 3 was also confirmed by the demonstration that exogenous application of transgenin 3 in APOE4 astrocytes could rescue the pro-inflammatory phenotype as it is shown here by the significant decrease of IL-6 and IL-8 level upon stimulation. And of great interest, we also observed that transgenin 3 supplementation in APOE4 for astrocytes associated with a reduced expression of some members of the NF-kappa-B signaling pathway, such as the P50 here and the P52 subunits. And interestingly, by performing, performing some nano DSF experiment, we have been able to demonstrate the existence of physical interaction between transgenin 3 and e kappa -B alpha which is a critical regulator of the NF-kappa-B signaling pathway. So ultimately, we wondered how APOE could regulate transgenin 3 expression. So due to the limited time today, I will not enter too much into the details. But in short, what we have identified is that there is a link between histone deacetylases activity and the APOE genotype. And this suggested that the epigenetic remodeling induced by APOE4 could be involved in the regulation of transgenin 3. And this actually was confirmed by demonstrating that the use of borinostat, also called SAHA, as you can see here, which is a broad spectrum inhibitor of histone deacetylases, this application of SAHA in APOE4 uh, cultures allowed to increase the level of transgenin 3, as it is demonstrated here and quantified here. And this was concomitant to reduce inflammation as demonstrated by uh, the, the lower 
expression of IL6 and IL8 in those cells that were treated with the HDAC uh, inhibitors. So now, uh, basically, to sum up, what we have found is that starting from human iPSCs, we could generate APOE3 and APOE4 astrocytes. And we found that there is changes in the activity of histone deacetylases in this astrocyte that may impact on the expression of transgenin 3 that leads to changes in uh, nf kappa b activity and then to changes in the inflammatory response from these cells. But when it comes to the discovery of such molecular mechanisms with the IPSC technology, one question is usually asked, we asked which is how is this relevant to the clinical settings? And to address this ultimate question, we obtain uh, some post-mortem brain tissues from non-demented patients, non-demented individuals that carry the APOE3 allele in an homozygous, homozygous manner, but also some, some tissue patient from patients, from Alzheimer's patients with the APOE3 uh, genotype, as well as some uh, post-mortem tissue, brain tissue from Alzheimer's patients that carry the APOE4 allele. And then we decided on those samples to run the analysis of transgenin 3 expression. And there is something that is very interesting. First, we validated our in vitro observation in vivo by showing that the transgenin 3 expression in APOE3 carriers that do, did not develop Alzheimer's disease is much higher as compared to those patients that have developed Alzheimer's disease and that carry the APOE4 allele. But very interestingly, we also observed that transgenin 3 expression was downregulated in Alzheimer's patients that do not carry the APOE4 allele. And this indicates maybe that transgenin 3 downregulation may be a much broader mechanism related to um, Alzheimer's disease and not only specific to APOE4 carrier. So to conclude and to summarize, the takeaway message for today is that APOE4 associates with a pro-inflammatory profile in human astrocytes, that APOE is a regulator of inflammation in human astrocytes acting via the nf kappa -B signaling pathway, that APOE regulates transgenin-3 expression, which is a negative regulator of nf kappa -B through epigenetic regulation, and that transgenin-3 is downregulated in astrocytes from APOE4 carriers, as well as in the brain of Alzheimer's disease patients. So now, maybe what could be interesting to do, and this is where we are going to move in the future in my team, is to, to try to see whether it could be interesting to target astrocyte reactivity to prevent inflammation and to reduce the risk for Alzheimer's disease. And to that hand, what, what must be done is to identify uh, molecular targets in astrocytes that could be of interest. We have, as I already showed you here, identified transgenin 3 as one of these potential interesting targets. And we are also actually leading a collaboration with the, the team of uh, Flavio Maina and collaboration with Rosanna Dono um, on another um, molecule that is the, the GPC4, the GPC4, the Glipican 4 that could be also a very interesting molecular target to uh, reduce inflammation in astrocytes. And this other project is actually, has been actually funded by the Neuro Marseille program and Neuro School program to uh, initiate this collaboration. And to conclude, I would like to acknowledge uh, the team, uh, especially I would like to thank Laurie Arnaud that is now a postdoc at the CIA CMIL uh, at Lumini. With, uh, with Rejan Rua, and she has been the one leading this experiment that I uh, showed you the results. I would like to thank also my, my engineers, Louise, Delphine, and Angelique, as well as Pedro that uh, is always uh, uh, giving us some advice regarding the, the project. Uh, I have actually an open position for a postdoc uh, in my lab. I would like to thank my supports and my collaborators, and now I will be happy to take your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. There is um, already one question uh, from yes. Ambre Linossier. Are the generated uh, cells from IPSC identical to the ones found in living organism, or do they really closely replicate their phenotype? 
Well, the, the, that's the, 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 this question can be related to any other cell type that we can derive from iPSCs. So in general, yes, the, the cells that we derive from iPSCs, they are close to the ones that we can find in vivo. They are not exactly the same, especially in terms of maturity. It, we can have some differences in terms of the maturity of the cells. We can easily imagine that uh, as compared to a cell that has been mature for years in the brain, uh, something that we have in a dish for a few, uh, few weeks or few months uh, is not as mature as what we have in vivo. But in general, we can reproduce the identity of the, of the cell type in vitro uh, with the iPSC technology. Okay, thank you. There are another question. You can raise the hand if you want to ask, uh, to ask uh, Emmanuel directly without me talking, which might be better. Dorian, can you see any question coming? No, I don't see one. Maybe they're gonna try to write it, I think. Question coming. Okay. Manuel, you were too clear. <laughs> oh, not enough. Okay, I have <laughs> one. I have one raised hand, so I'm gonna try yes. to let it talk. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Manuel um, El Sharif. I, I had a question about uh, uh, CRISPR uh, technology. Did you use a base editor for uh, making the transition from? Uh, Apple three to Apple four, and did you did you make the reverse experiment? So um, thank you, thank you, Al Sharif. Uh, nice to hear you. Um, you. You ask if I used what base editor? Yes. So um, you know the the tools that are designed specifically to to change one base for another base. So there is different uh, version. Like GC or yeah yeah no no we, we didn't we didn't do we didn't do that and and regarding the the reverse experiment that you asked which is I guess um, to uh, to change the APOE4 uh, genotype into an APOE3 genotype uh, this is something uh, that we have been trying to do but we didn't achieve it yet okay and and when you make the the knock-in experiment you you control the the place where the the copy is inserted in yeah the... yeah yeah that, that that's uh, that that's a specific uh, insertion of the snip so we target specifically the region that has to be uh, modified to change the apoe genotype so yeah definitely that that's a very specific uh, targeting it's not like overexpressing a mutant uh, a mutant gene that will uh, overexpress the apoe4 isoform we specifically change just one nucleotide in the APOE uh, code uh, on the genome. Okay, thank you, Emmanuel. No problem. Thanks, Ed Sharif. Okay, so I have another one that I'm going to put. Hey, Manuel, it's Pedro. <laughs> Um, I wanted to thank you for the thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you whether you have checked in the in those uh, cells that have uh, that are lacking expression of trangelin three uh, or that are were expressing trangelin three. Have you seen if this activation of the of the inflammatory profile is more related to neuroprotective or neurotoxic uh, profile of astrocytes? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a tricky question because, yes, as you, uh, as you know, I mean, in the astrocyte, astrocytic field, there is this uh, binary classification that has been uh, announced at some point that we have a neuro, neuroprotective and neurotoxic astrocytes. Uh, actually, the things are not that simple. Uh, we didn't check, especially for transgenin 3, but at least for the APOE4 genotype, when, when we look at our cells, 
we couldn't distinguish a specific um, profile of those astrocytes. So we couldn't really classify uh, those astrocytes into one or the other of these two categories. But again, I think the reality is not that simple in terms of uh, classification of astrocytes. OK, thank you. And I think that's all for, for all the raise the hand questions. OK, thank you. Okay. Oh, if you have uh, more questions later on, don't hesitate to write directly to all uh, our speakers. But I thank very much for their uh, participation. That was really interesting. And I hope you uh, enjoyed doing it. Um, so thank you again. And uh, for everybody, I give you, um, what is the next date? Next month? Um, oh no, next month, uh, no new webinar because uh, we are all going to meet at the Nobel Prize conference, the 4th of April. That will be really interesting. So I hope to see you there. And uh, we'll meet uh, for the next uh, neuro webinar in May. Hey, uh, meantime, I wish you well and have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.